Today we're going to look at a nice problem from the Bolivian team selection test for a mathematical Olympiad. And this is from the year 2021. But maybe broader than this, this is an example of something called an arithmetic derivative. Oh, but let's maybe read the question before we get into that. So let's suppose we've got a function f. It goes from natural numbers to integers and it satisfies two rules. First, for every prime p, f of p is equal to 1. And then for every natural number x and y, we have f of x times y equals x times f of y plus y times f of x. And this really gets to the reason that I said that this was like an arithmetic derivative. Because if we look at this equation right here, that looks suspiciously similar to the product rule for, you know, derivatives of functions. For instance, if we were to rewrite this as x times y prime equals x times y prime plus y times x prime, where by doing the prime of these objects, that's the same thing as, well, let's see, evaluating it at f, well then this looks exactly like the Leibniz rule or the product rule for derivatives. Okay, so anyway, let's get down to what we wanna show here or what we wanna find. Our goal is to find the smallest natural number bigger than or equal to 2021 such that f of n is equal to n. But in this new prime notation, you know, motivated by the fact that this is like an arithmetic derivative, that's like solving the arithmetic differential equation n prime equals n. Well, for an n value that is bigger than or equal to 2021. Okay, so I'm not particularly gonna use this prime notation up here. I really just wrote that down to see that this is really similar to a derivative. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's jump into the main solution. And I'm gonna start with the following, you know, very simple observation. And that is, well, what does this function do to the square of a prime? Well, this is in fact pretty easy to calculate because this is f of the prime times the prime. And so we can just use our rule over here, our you know product rule, where x and y are both equal to p. So we have p times f of p plus another p times f of p. But we know that each of these f of p's is equal to one by our first rule. So that simply gives us two times p. But now one more time, I'm gonna rewrite this in derivative notation. And look what we have here. We have the derivative, if you will, the arithmetic derivative of p squared is equal to two times p. And this is gonna hold for any prime. And so the primes here are like the variables, if you will. Okay, and now I'm not gonna prove this super carefully, but you can inductively show that this extends to maybe what you would consider the power rule in calculus. So in other words, f of p to the a power is a times p to the a minus one. And like I said, you can prove that with induction fairly easily. Okay, well now let's see what this does to unequal primes. So let's notice that if we have f of p times q, where those are distinct primes, well, that'll turn into p times f of q plus q times f of p. In other words, it's p plus q. But then again, inductively on this for distinct primes p1 through pk, we have f of p1 times p2 all the way up to pk gives us the following. So it's gonna give us p2 multiplied up to pk plus p1 times p3 multiplied up to pk all the way up to p1 multiplied up to pk minus one. So what's going on there is that we are in fact 
just writing a sum of this object where we've removed one of the primes each time. And in fact, there's some notation for this, and that would be, we would write this as the sum as j goes from 1 to k of p1 multiplied up to pj multiplied up to pk, but we can put, put this hat over the pj. That indicates that we're removing this term. So let's just say here we're removing this p sub j term. Okay, now maybe one more step. Let's look at f of p to the a times q to the b. So that's going to be equal to q to the b times f of p to the a plus p to the a times f of q to the b. But observe, that's going to be a times p to the a minus 1 times q to the b plus b times p to the a times q to the b minus 1. But that turns into p to the a minus 1 times q to the b minus 1 times, let's see, we have a q plus b p. So the important thing here is that the starting power of q is now a coefficient of p, whereas the starting power of p is now a coefficient of q. So now let's start, or let's start our next set of steps with a generalization of this equation. Okay, so generalizing that equation we had at the bottom of the last board, we have the following. And this gives us really a general formula for f applied to any natural number, given the fact that we know something about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So observe that f of p1 to the a1 multiplied all the way up to pk to the ak, where we are assuming that the pi's are um, distinct primes, gives us this product p1 to the a1 minus 1 all the way up to pk to the ak minus 1 times the sum of aj times the product of those primes where we remove the jth prime. And there's actually a name for something like this. So if you take the product of all of the primes that divide a certain natural number, that's called the radical of that natural number. So this is indeed rad n over, let's see, pj. And of course that is if we set up here the fact that we're calling n equal to this number p1 to the a1 all the way up to pk to the ak. So again, just to reiterate, the radical of a natural number is the product of all of its primes, where you just change all of the exponents to the number one. Okay, so now that we've got this general formula, let's talk about solving this equation f of n equals n, this thing that I earlier called an arithmetic differential equation. Okay, so let's suppose that we have n equals, I guess I'm rewriting this, p1 to the a1 all the way up to pk to the ak, and we know f of n is equal to n. But now let's see what that tells us. That tells us that p1 to the a1 all the way up to pk to the ak, that's n, so we're going to rewrite this in the other order, is equal to f of n. So I'm going to write f of n using this equation over here, here on the right-hand side. So we have p1 to the ak minus 1 multiplied up to pk to the ak minus 1 times our sum as j goes from 1 up to k of a sub j. And I'm going to use this notation, the radical of n over p sub j. But now let's observe that I can most definitely divide by this coefficient p1 to the ak minus 1 all the way up to pk to the ak minus 1 given that the exponents in the primes on the left hand side are one larger. So if we divide both sides of the equation by this term, we get a nice new equation. And that is, well, p1 to the 1 power, p2 to the 1 power, all the way up to pk to the first power is equal to that, well, just that sum. So let's see. We have p1 multiplied all the way up to pk, which recall that's the radical of n, equals our sum as j goes from 1 up to k 
of, let's see, aj, and then we have this radical of n over p sub j. And now let's make the following fairly simple observation, and that is that for all i going between 1 and k, we have pi divides the left-hand side of this equation. So that's clear because pi is definitely a factor in here. But if it divides the left-hand side of the equation, then that means that pi divides the right-hand side of this equation, which is this over here. But then also, we know that pi divides a times j, or a sub j, times the radical of n over p sub j for all j not equal to i. That's because this radical of n over pj definitely has a factor of p sub i in it when we don't have equality there. That's based off of the fact that, well, this is simply the product forgetting the jth term. But as long as we don't forget the ith term, then this right-hand side it definitely contains a p sub i. But that's every term from this sum except for the ith term. So if p sub i divides every term from this sum except the ith term, and we know it divides the whole sum, then it must divide the ith term. So in other words, we have p sub i divides, let's see, a sub i times, I'm going to rewrite this as p1 all the way up to pi with a hat over it, all the way up to pk, just because I think that's clearer at this point. But observe that pi doesn't divide anything that I'm underlining in green. And that's because those are all distinct primes, and those distinct primes do not include pi. So if pi does not divide that green underlined stuff, then that means that pi must divide this ai. So here we have pi must divide ai, which means ai is in fact equal to something that I'll call ci times pi, where ci is a natural number, because divisibility can be rewritten as being a multiple of a certain number. Okay, great. But what does that mean? Well, that means we can go up here and rewrite this as, well, instead of just some number ai, this is gonna be c1 times p1 all the way up to ck times pk. Okay. So now let's maybe change this suppose to maybe like a squiggly arrow because that's what we have done so far. We've produced that. And now let's clear everything below it and we'll finish it off. Okay, so this is where we were and now we're ready to finish it off. So let's notice that we want n, which is p1 to the c1a1 all the way up to pk to the ck pk to be equal to f of n, which will be p1 and then this c1 p1 minus 1 all the way up to p1 ck pk minus 1 times the sum of cj times the product p1 all the way up to p k, where no longer do we need to remove the pj term because we multiplied it in given the fact that, well, our aj had this pj term in it. Okay, so now let's again divide by this thing which now I'm underlining in green and that gives us a new equation. So notice we'll have this product p1 all the way up to pk equals this sum as j goes from 1 to k of cj and then we can factor out this product p1 up to pk because that's in every term. But then dividing by that product, which recall we called the radical earlier, we have this you know, very simple Diophantine equation, which is the sum as j goes from 1 to k of cj equals 1. But if we're adding a bunch of natural numbers up and we're getting the number 1, that means that, well, we must only in the end have a single natural number and it must be equal to one. So in other words, k is equal to one. 
Look up here, we really left k as a variable. We didn't know how large that product one product was. And furthermore, k is equal to 1 and c sub 1 is equal to 1. In other words, our n is equal to, well, p to the p power. I could call that as p1 to the p1 power, but we might as well just simplify it. Okay, so let's maybe put a box around that and let's check that everything works. So let's notice that f of p to the p is equal to p times p to the p minus 1, which is p to the p. So yes, this does solve our equation f of n equals n. And now we simply need to make a list of the first several primes and, well, their p powers and see which one first is larger than 2021. So notice that 2 to the 2 is equal to 4, that's too small. 3 to the 3 is equal to 27, that's too small. And then next up, 5 to the 5 is equal to 3,125, that's just right. So that means our answer, our number that satisfies this equation, that is the first one larger than 2021 is 5 to the 5 or 3,125. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, Subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.